A very good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, almost lost my shoe. What would my mother say? A very good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, distinguished guests. My name is Eleni Jokos. I am uh, a correspondent for CNN. I'm absolutely delighted to be with you today. What we are going to be seeing is with that fact that we are on the brink of greatness. I want you to picture this. A single market worth $3 trillion, 1.2 billion people being able to move freely. No tariffs, no trade barriers. The ability to trade and move freely across the continent. It is a vision that had been discussed by our predecessors, that had been dreamed of by many people before us. And we are the generation that will be able to implement this. And I'm not saying that we're very close to this. Perhaps we are. We still have to embark on a lot of reform. We've got to make sure that there's coordinated action in terms of regulation, that there's something that we can actually draw across the board to make the movement of goods easier, doing business easier across Africa, something a lot of CEOs keep telling me about, that it's very difficult if you want to expand, moving into other territories, infrastructure deficits, power deficits, but the people in this room are going to be the ones that can perhaps ensure that we see this change. So ladies and gentlemen, our very first panel discussion this morning, making a single market work for African businesses. Our first uh, panelist that I'd like to call on, we have His Excellency the President of Rwanda, Paul Kagame. So. Her Excellency, the President of Ethiopia, Sakhle Work Zude. Madam President. Pleasure. Philippe Blair, Chief Executive Officer at the IFC. Yes, please. Nagweeb Sawiris. Chairman of Arascom Investment Holding and Chairman of La Mancha Holding. Thank you. Abdul Samad Rabiu, Chairman and CEO of the Bua Group. And we have Carlos Lopez, the Honorary Professor at the University of Cape Town and Visiting Fellow of the University of Oxford, as well as former Executive Secretary at UNECA. Thank you, Carlos. Right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists this morning. Uh, we get the honor of kicking off the conversation, putting things into perspective, and perhaps uh, telling our audience how we can get this right. President Kagame, Your Excellency, I'd like to start off with you. You've been so integral in making this happen, and we're so close. And I say this because we've got 21 countries that have currently ratified. 22 have actually ratified, but 21 have actually passed it through Parliament. So we're really close, because we only need 22 countries. But then the Nigeria problem kind of lingers on in the sidelines. How close are we to doing this? We are very close. Uh, even... Uh with Nigeria, I think, uh, uh, from my reading of things, uh, they are uh, sorting things out uh, in that direction. I think they will be naturally part of the continental free trade area because of the sense it makes mm. uh, and 
it makes that sense to Nigeria as well, as, as, uh, and especially given the benefits and the impact it would have on Nigeria, but also Nigeria impacting uh, the economy of the continent. Is, is, the facts are very obvious. I think we are getting there. Are you talking with President Buhari at the moment? Are we, cl are we close? <laughs> Not at the moment, but we were talking uh, with uh, President Buhari in the build-up to where we okay. are now. And uh, I think that is as significant as uh, talking to him now. Madam President, um, Ethiopia has recently signed, which of course is a very big move to making this happen. And it's interesting because when we look at Ethiopia, we know that um, a lot of trade tariffs have protected local industry. And here you are moving against uh, what we've seen as a trend coming through in Ethiopia. Tell me about the thinking behind signing this and what you're hoping to achieve. Yeah. No, thank you very much. I mean, um, I'm really happy to be here today, just a few days after the ratification by our parliament. I wish we were the 22nd and we would be to have heralded the, you know, the, yeah. the beginning of this great uh, project that we have. In, in Ethiopia is a good example because, you know, um, it, in our history, we, we, we belong to many economic groupings, but uh, in some areas we were there, but not fully there. Mm. So compliance with, with some uh, uh, rules and, and so on has been very difficult. But we have also understood that there is no other alternative than integration. It's not only with the, the CFTA. Uh, the recent past would show you that uh, in normalizing our relationship with our immediate neighbors, especially the northern neighbor Eritrea, opened the door to a better integration yeah. of the region, a, a bigger, stable region that we can have. So um, I, I think we have seen our responsibility in that, and um, I don't think that there is no other alternative than going back to our fundamentals which is the economic integration of the continent. Fantastic. Mr. Leueru, um, if you could just give me an indication of what the IFC plans to do in terms of uh, a player. You currently have work around 30 markets at any one time in Africa, and I know you want to get into the smaller countries because you're mostly in the likes of South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, and Kenya. I know your problems usually are about reforms, about regulation, about policy, and that's, of course, a big hindrance. But you've also been able to assist a lot of countries in getting those things right. What role will the IFC play? Well, as part of the, of the new strategy that I tried to lay out, I mean, we need to become much more proactive, and which means upstream. Upstream means more than before. We always worked with governments. But frankly, we were a little bit, it was kind of first work with yeah. the existing private sector and then the government, but it was like a second. Now, if you want to really create opportunities, create is a dynamic word. It's not reactive as a pure financier, but work as a partner. We need to work upstream. That's a, a shift about mindset, to use the, yeah. the word of the president, which is very important. And that means engaging. We, do, we have a new product that is called uh, Country Private Sector Diagnostic that we do. Our ambition is to do that in every country to see where are these opportunities, yeah. where are the changes that will trigger the opportunity. Are opportunities increasing? And are you seeing those countries, those numbers increasing? Well, we, we are working on it. So far, we are at the 3 billion. We want mm -hmm. to go to 10. It's not going to happen by itself. So we're starting, I gave one example, we have an example that we're working on right here, since we're in Rwanda, to create a whole mortgage market. That doesn't exist. Creating it, supply and demand. That work means working with the government, working with the private sector, working with our colleagues on the World Bank. So that's the ambition. And we believe we can move and move very fast. And, we, and working more closely with our colleagues from the World Bank, we're part of the World Bank group. Yeah. Work with them much more closely. And that's what we have done, and we can unlock possibility that didn't exist before. That's the key. Mr. Sawiri, so I know you've got operations in West Africa, mining operations. Of course, your main market being Egypt, but you have a large footprint and you understand different markets. How is this going to be a game changer for you, and are you on board when you see the CFTA and the policy that it's going to bring? 
I think as the President Kagami correctly said, the challenges are going to be in the implementation. Yeah. I mean, you know, when government signs something and then we need to go and then deal with the bureaucrats that <laughs> <laughs> have to implement these big, big agreements, then the problems start, you know. But the significant change here in this approach of the IFC, which I really welcome, is that when we as private sector uh, reach out to um, governments, there's always the suspicious, you know, that governments are suspicious that we are here just to come and take some money and make some money and run. This is suspicious to the entrepreneur, you know, that he has bad intentions. But it, the intentions are not bad. He wants to make profit, make money, but make uh, the country also richer and create jobs and, 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 and give, give. It's not just take, you know. So having the IFC, let's say, iron the road or, or become an active player, which means prepare Let's say I'm an investor here, in a, I'm in diversified. So I'm in mining and real estate, mm -hmm. uh, I'm in financial institutions, IT, telecom. So let's say I come here in, in, in Rwanda and I want to invest in real estate and there is no mortgage program. So how I will sell my units that I'll build, you know? But if the program has been created and the IFC has prepared the ground and all what I need is to come and build and sell the units, I'm in business. Exactly, and that's an interesting point, Mr. Lopez. When you think about businesses wanting to go into other territories, the things that they think about, the ease of doing business, how long it's going to take to start a business, you know, the tax structures there, and of course, any kind of institutions to make sure that if things go wrong, someone's going to enforce the law. But that said, intra-Africa trade has been increasing as well. And there's a reason why it's still so low. Are we going to be able to get rid of those problems through just one policy? I know it's gonna take coordinated action, but what is your prognosis on the matter? Well, to start with right now, uh, just two of the largest intra-African investors, South Africa and Morocco, create more jobs with their investments than India, the UK, and Germany combined. Yeah. So we have basically a different pattern when you have an intra-African investor. We also have another very important indication that the intra-Africa trade is basically on value addition, whereas the Africa trade with the rest of the world is mostly commodity driven. So we need the value addition. And there is a reason for it. It's because you constitute value chains when you do this type of investments. But of course, the challenge of implementation, let's just give one example. It takes up to 700 hours to process documentation in some African borders. It costs about $2,500 a day to process documentation for import and export in some countries. So this is unacceptable. We have issues of trade facilitation, but we also have issues of just logistics. Mm -hmm. The logistics of exporting from Africa to another African country is really brutal. Uh, it costs more to get the goods to Mombasa from here than it costs from Mombasa to China. Wow. And this is just not possible to continue. So those are the possibilities that the CFTA is going to address if we do things right. But to do things right, there are lots of negotiations that have to take mm -hmm. place. Right now we have agreements in most of the protocols for trade and goods, but we have huge problems to address such as intellectual property, such as rules of origin, such as how we are going to deal with the mammoth task of basically having the tariff schedules all coordinated and synchronized in, 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 in a time frame that is not going to be penalizing the momentum that has been created by these fast ratifications. And right now we have basically 50% more costs in doing trade in Africa than we do in East Asia. And to change that, we'll have to be able to really have more than just political will. We need a lot of technicality too. What is it gonna take? Well, I think uh, what we have witnessed so far is that you know, we got just about two years of negotiations to get to the agreement. It was signed a year ago, here we are, 52 adherents, 21 ratifications, if we compare it with any other common approach of negotiations of this scale, and this is the largest, yeah. so we don't have a comparator, but of this scale, such as the European Union and others, it took 
in average about 10 years more. So we are not doing bad. That sounds really good, but we have a problem, Mr. Rabiu. <laughs> Your president hasn't signed as yet. Has the government engaged with the private sector and does the private sector want to be part of the CFDA? Yes, thank you, Eleni. But let me say a few words you know, about the CFDA before I answer your question. Yeah. To also buttress you know, what His Excellency Paul Kagamian said, you know, CFDA is very important and uh, it is a, a very important agreement. And I think you know, all of us in Africa you know, need the CFDA. It is something that you know, can actually help you know, uh, drive and push the post-2015 Africa Development Agenda as well as the 2063 Agenda. So it is a good thing, we all know that. The benefits are there, we know the benefits also, you know, from agriculture to food production, manufacturing to mining, you know, financial services, IT, you know, and also, you know, more importantly, you know, in, in this case, is the fact that, you know, free movement of people, ease of doing business. And as we all know, less than 25% of Africans actually travel to other parts of Africa. So free movement of people is very, very important. And uh, as far as I know, there are only two countries in Africa, Seychelles and Rwanda now, that have free access you know, to all Africans. You know, Your Excellency, thank you so much for your vision and leadership. So we actually need you know, to have this. It is a very important thing. However, the structure as it is really does not favor some countries in Africa, you know, like Nigeria, which has not signed. And that is because I believe of the huge population and also the you know, uh, high dependence on imports. Nigeria has not signed, although I'm not talking on behalf of the government yeah. of Nigeria, but I would say this because I know Mr. President has set up a committee you know, to look into this. And one of the issues is that there is a regional you know, uh, agreement, block agreement, economic block agreement in, in West Africa, which is the ETLS. Economic, you know, ECOWAS Trade Liberalization Scheme, which has been in, you know, effect for quite some time, and some of the members are actually not just respecting that. We have a situation in Nigeria where a lot of, you know, companies are actually, you know, producing goods, but they cannot import to, for example, uh, Benin Republic, a cement manufacturer, a cement plant in Nigeria, which is just about, you know, maybe two, three hundred kilometers away from Benin Republic, we cannot, even though Burkina Faso and, you know, uh, Benin Republic and Niger and Chad, they are all members of this uh, ETLS. So the experience and the lessons learned are what is making Nigeria very wary, that look, we have an agreement here, you know, an arrangement is not being respected. How are we sure even the CFTA, mm -hmm. Big Island, is going to work? You know, and that is one. And then secondly, also the fact that Nigeria, you know, with its huge population, over 200 million people, the biggest in Africa, you know, and, you know, having, you know, dependence on imports, you know, most of the time, we are worried also because if we allow, you know, uh, this CFT, of course it is, you know, it's something that has been discussed and I'm sure at the end of the day, maybe it will, it will be achieved. But then again, you know, the concern is that what about dumping? What if, yeah. for example, these borders are open? Nigeria is a big country. We import a lot of these goods. If some of these smaller countries are importing, you know, things, you know, say from other nations like China and what have you, and then dumping into Nigeria. Mm. So dumping and then the former, um, the, the, the current trade pacts are not as effective. Exactly. Those are the I two mean, issues. This, this is though my opinion. Yeah. I'm not talking on behalf of the government of yeah. Nigeria. You know, so Let me get commentary from um, President Kangame. So these are really important issues. We know that various trading blocks haven't been as successful as they should have been, even though the EAC is a beacon of hope, perhaps. Dumping is another big issue. Looking at the CFTA, how is it going to ensure that we, we can firstly make this trade pact work, and then secondly, um, do away with any problems on dumping? For more details, we can uh, rely on uh, uh, expertise with some people here, like uh, Carlos and, and others, but I, I say what I uh, also understand. You see, indeed, like uh, those other arrangements, CFTA does not 
solve problems per se until people make it work. Yeah. So it, it, what doesn't make work the other arrangements will also affect CFTA. But CFTA is, is there so that those areas and people where things have worked, it's, it's, a continued, it's continued progress. Now, so we shouldn't hold on to the safety and say it won't work just because something else has not worked because it has worked in some places and for some people. So let's continue forward so that for those it is not working, we can also, or they can also be brought on board and they need to attend to some of those things affecting them so that uh, they realize the benefits that are there to be realized. So I think we don't expect to put uh, uh, a mechanism or something in place and just expect it to work. No, it, it needs an effort. People will have to do or to undertake certain things so that things work for them. What is not being questioned here is the benefit of those other organizations, whether they are sub-regional or otherwise, or the CFTA. There is no question. Nobody is saying that this is not the right way to go. Nobody is saying that this is not going to give us benefits. Actually, it is the only way to go if you want to maximize on the benefits and opportunities and for the development of our continent. So we just have to make it work. And we know how to make it work. But we are also aware of the challenges that have to be dealt with. There's got to be political will as well, right? And that's really important. Political will is in everything. Yes, uh, Carlos mentioned a while ago about uh, technical aspects of doing things. This is real, this is a must. But political will allows things that must work to work. <laughs> this is the whole thing. Political will must come first. Madam President, um, Ethiopia is one of the fastest growing economies on the continent. It's all for low base, many people say, but you're starting to see movement on the manufacturing side of things. Agriculture is doing much better. There's also something that people are concerned about regarding the CFTA, and that being that the stronger economies with stronger value chains are going to cannibalize the smaller economies or economies that have weaker manufacturing bases. How are you thinking about this going into the CFTA, and is it a worry for you? Well, uh, as said, there are many um, challenges that uh, we, we yeah. need to discuss. CFT has given, well, uh, I'll repeat what President Kagame has said. I'm not an expert in that, nor am I an economist, but I know where we should be heading to. And um, there is no uh, uh, future uh, prosper for a prosperous Africa, which is the, at the origin of, of all what we did, yeah. if we don't go um, uh, through it. But uh, nevertheless, it has a lot of challenges, and that's what we are going to start yeah. addressing. It gives the framework, but not the details of what should be done. We need to have our national um, uh, you know, uh, policies in, in terms of implementing it. Uh, but there are best practices. I have been following in my previous life the East African community. Uh, there were fears and under the control of President Kagame that uh, you know, some countries will lose in terms of revenue and they have created a fund to address it. But to my knowledge, they have not accessed the fund, which means some of the fears have been overcome in, 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 yeah. in the process. So I, I think we can, we can learn a lot. Uh, if we see the glass half full, and th there is no other alternative than going that way if we want to change the narrative about this continent. You know, the creation of the AU, there was the same debate. People didn't believe that it would address the, 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 the issues of, 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 of Africans. But uh, I think it did. So we, we are at the same stage, and um, we, we need to give full... Um, confidence and credit to what we are doing, and uh, that way I think we can move. But this is not in any way to undermine the challenges or yeah. the losses that uh, we can have, but 
the winds. It's going to be net positive, right? Yep. Mrs. Sawiris, we need infrastructure. I mean, CEOs in this room are going to say, great, you've got this policy, you want to do away with the, you know, the 700 hours that it takes to, to cross uh, the border with goods, but how are you going to get the goods there? So who's going to build the infrastructure, who's going to pay for it, and is the private sector keen to get involved? Uh, I think the private sector will be waiting uh, when it comes to infrastructure, because first of all, it is a very large and massive amount, and then the returns are long, and are not very uh, clearly to determine how are you going to get your money back if you, I mean, uh, let's take a country like South of Sudan. They don't, they, it's a new country, so they don't have a single paved road. And, and they cannot transport anything, they manufacture or agriculture, they have to import everything just because they don't have the road. So I think this is a task of the World Bank when IFC said they'll work with other institutions. And I hope also that the World Bank and IFC and others will reform themselves too because the bureaucracy, bureaucracy cycle. This is what I want to say. Oh, no. To get money from the World Bank or the my, my IFC personal, needs a lot of my, work my and time. My personal experience with the World Bank and IFC, I mean, this was a long time ago, so don't yeah. be. <laughs> <laughs> What's horrible? I mean, they take two years to decide on any project. So if it's an infrastructure project, I think it has to come first from the World Bank with a massive financing. It has to be approved and ready to go, and then we can come in, we can come in with equity, we can come in with the execution, we can bring our construction mm -hmm. companies and execute. But don't, the private sector is, as, as the IFC too is savvy when they invest, we are also savvy when we invest, we need to see the returns, and infrastructure is a long term, and most probably it has to be done either by governments or by the, the new uh, invaders, like China and the others, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes, sir, please comment on this. And I feel like we're having deja vu because I keep asking the World Bank and the IFC when you're going to do things quicker. Thanks to Tutongo. <laughs> so so what about. do you need? I, I think that uh, I have to disagree partly with what you say because more and more in the world you see, in fact, privately finance and manage infrastructure. Now, is it true for all infrastructure? No. So you have to be clear what infrastructure can be commercialized where you need a profit, which means a return, a flow of money? Why should an extension of an airport add public debt when it should be a source of revenues for, for the government? Why should a port be done by increasing public debt, which is pretty high in many countries already? Why do a telecom system be done by increasing public debt? when the private sector can make a lot of money. Where do a uh, solar plant be done by the public sector when we can do it in the private sector, etc., etc. So I think even in, in the, I know you want to go to the, to the time questions, how fast we are, but it's, it, I think the, the world has evolved. When I was young, telecom was taught as a natural monopoly. Now, if you say that now to a class of economy students, they laugh at you. Yeah. The world has changed. changed. The, the, and now the, the, you have private sector solution, including for some, not all. If you want rural roads, there's no private sector solution. Yeah. If you want, I don't know, waste, some of it can be private, but not all. So it's more subtle than, you know, all infrastructure is public or all this is it's private. I'm cognizant of time, so I want to go to Mr. Rabio. I know that you're in ports, you're in cement, you're in all sorts of things, and you're still in Nigeria. Why haven't you expanded? And are you thinking of expanding, and would you help with the infrastructure build? What do you need to make that happen? Well, yes. Uh, Nigeria is a very interesting country because, as we all know, it's the biggest you know, economy and it's in a big market. And as it is today, we still have quite a lot to do. And of course, you know, there are quite a lot of opportunities in outside Nigeria. But I think if I can talk on the issue of infrastructure that you just mentioned, you know, I think it is key, you know, for us to actually, you know, have this, you know, because the governments, private sector, you know, policy makers, decision makers must all come together, especially also with the DFIs, you know, to try and improve on the infrastructure in Africa, because really we need to do quite a lot. I mean, if you look at the Trans-African Highway, which was envisioned, you know, way back in the 70s, nothing has really been achieved. Yeah. And this is something that I think the private sector can actually, you know, assist, you know, by sitting down and see how we can, as Mr. Swari said, see how we can partner with the governments and DFIs. 
look at you know you know other countries everybody is doing you know quite a lot of things are happening all over the world africa needs to move on we can actually start even with this trans african highway there are about nine highways i mean think of lagos mombasa you know the highway 8 you know which is something that i think you know if we can get you know construction companies and cement manufacturers steel companies from africa you know sit down and talk to them and see what we can do i'm sure quite a number of us would be more than willing to actually partner Without necessarily, you know, having to sell, you know, at high price. I'm not trying to market yeah. my, my cement now. <laughs> I'm just trying to make a point, you know. Yeah. I mean, like, we can look at maybe tolling or maybe deferred payment over time. And this is something that is important. If we're able to link West Africa and East Africa, which is about 6,000 kilometers, it would be quite interesting, you know. Then it would even help, you know, our businesses. So I think the issue of infrastructure is key because even with the CFTA, even if we're able to get it, which I'm sure we will at the end of the day, but without proper infrastructure, it will, it will not make a, a lot of sense. Fantastic. President Kagame, the busiest port between Uganda and Rwanda is currently under construction, so it's been closed. And we've actually seen the impact of businesses saying, well, we can't get trucks through and so forth. So this is a big question that a lot of people have been asking. Is there anything we need to worry about between Uganda and Rwanda? Can you clarify for us? Because we were talking about having political will is you know, having political will with your neighbors is going to be of paramount importance. Absolutely. Uh, I think that explains the point in the sense that the problem is not the road or the road being constructed. The problem is politics. Really? Behind that, you have... Uh, you have, uh, for example, we have hundreds of people from here, from Rwanda, arrested, detained in a prison for months, for years, in Uganda, without being charged, without appearing anywhere in court. They are piling up in a prison. Now, which means the message is, don't go to Uganda. It's like Uganda is telling Rwandans, don't come here. We have raised this issue for the last two years with the Ugandan government. We said, if you have people who have committed crimes in Uganda, who have come from Rwanda, or who are coming there to commit crimes, deal with that legally. Deal with that openly. At least, that's minimum. You can imagine, not only have they not been treated through the legal process, they have not even been given consular, consular access. Even ambassadors, diplomats cannot go to visit these people because some of them are locked up in places that are not known. We have engaged with Uganda for the last two years talking about that but we are getting nowhere. We've brought it up with many of our friends who have talked to all of us. It doesn't lead us anywhere. So, but, but let me go not stay on that. So what, that's one part. The other part, I'm sure maybe some of the uh, business people who were affected are in this room. We had containers leaving Kigari, going to Mombasa. You have to go through Uganda if you're going to Mombasa. We have, uh, actually, the irony here is that both of us are landlocked. Uganda is landlocked, we are landlocked. <laughs> but we, we, for us, we fa when it is that route, we face uh, double the problem of being landlocked because Uganda landlocks us. Uh, uh, the, the containers of minerals that were leaving uh, uh, Rwanda, going through Mombasa, were held in Uganda for five months. Wow. And when we were asking, first of all, we checked here, the revenue people and others had cleared the, the, the containers. We, uh, they contacted their counterparts in Uganda. They actually told them there is nothing. We ha they have cleared them. Then you say, why are they being held? You say, no, messages came from somewhere. 
and, and they said, no, they should not go. <laughs> this, this is a, a, an investor, a foreign investor. He's not even a Rwandan. He's a, a company from Germany. And then uh, there were people from Kenya who were importing uh, milk uh, from Rwanda. I think they were buying milk all the way from Rwanda, from Uganda for processing. I think they have huge capacity. And uh, the containers from here were held in Uganda for days until tens of thousands of liters were spoiled. And we've been bringing up this. No. So that is, that is the background. But for, for what is happening at the border, we have three border points that connect us with Uganda or through Uganda. It is only one that actually is not working uh, to the full capacity. Maybe it is at about 20, 30 percent because of that construction that is being talked about. And we hope that in the next few weeks, maybe not even months, that should be working. So when this happened, at the time there was this other problem taking place, then it grew up into a much bigger problem. And um, so this is where we are. So politics is, is what is behind it rather than actually anything else. Thank you for being so open with us, um, President Kagabe. And this is very interesting because you've got, you know, um, politics getting involved in an economic, um, you know, standoff perhaps. I mean, is there retaliation that is happening, do you think, at the borders? I mean, you were talking about containers being held. And then when you see this as an example of what could possibly play out, if there isn't political will with your neighbors or even regionally, it's an example of how things can go wrong within a trade agreement, correct? That's, uh, that's uh, going to be there. It has to be attended to. You know, I'll give many examples. When we had actually the actual meeting, the CFTA summit here, those who followed the news, two days after I went to Uganda, I was visiting uh, uh, Uganda, and you know what had taken me there? It is actually to address this particular program I was talking about. I went to see the head of state, the president of Uganda, to say, what, what, what is this? Why is this happening? And, and I actually had the opportunity to brief the leadership there, the matters as we are discussed in the summit. I said, you see, there are big things here being discussed underway, but the two countries are caught up in this uh, things that we can't even justify. So why, why don't we work together to get, to get rid of this so that we even benefit from this big thing that is being yeah. discussed at the continental level? That was the reason I was visiting the country. But uh, I, I, there are things I can't explain that keep happening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, President Kagame. Um, Madam President, Tell me about the sectors that you're most excited about, and I'm actually glad that we mentioned the political world because that's going to be important. Tanzania hasn't signed yet um, either. Um, tell me about how you see things regionally. I mean, you mentioned Eritrea earlier, which of course is a fantastic example of how change can occur. Are there any sectors specifically that you're excited about? Um, and tell me about the vision that you have for the fastest growing economy on the continent. Yeah. Well, the um, ambition that we have is to maintain that growth, yeah. of course, uh, which has been there for the last decade, uh, but uh, for also have, uh, you know, building the, the new Ethiopia on, on, on that basis. But uh, as I have said earlier, uh, the, um, the reality is that uh, there is a limit to whatever you can do when you are limited within your national borders. Which borders have been inherited, artificial, as far yeah. as Africa is concerned. If we have in our constitutive act that uh, we, um, we abide to the, to the colonial borders, not because we like it, it's because there was no other alternative, but we know that it is obviously artificial. So moving forward, I, I, I think uh, in whatever we do, and especially when we have these challenges nowadays that knows no border, uh, no frontier that uh, doesn't have any passport to cross from one to the other. I think the coming together is really fundamental. So for Ethiopia, what is interesting is as much as we 
uh, concentrate in, 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 in the local and domestic politics because it's a new era that we have entered into, um, we have the same bold vision for, for, for the region. And uh, uh, that region has been lagging behind as when you compare it to uh, uh, West Africa and even the East African communities that I have mentioned earlier, uh, the, the Horn of Africa and, and that part uh, of, of the continent should be in a position to move faster. I think there is a good opportunity because for some um, or many of them, we have been into crisis, uh, peace and, and stability, and this is um, being overcome, and that's very, very important. And also it shows that uh, we have to go that way in order to precisely address the issues of, of peace and security as well. So development will be the, the, the best venue. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, we've run out of time. I just want to give one last word to President Kagame as we kick off the rest of the, the discussions. What do you hope to achieve out of this forum and hope to see from the private sector? Well, first of all, this forum uh, does us uh, proud as Africans. Uh, I want to start from there. I think it brings us together uh, to know where we are coming from, where we stand today, and where we should be going uh, in the near future, and what needs to be done. And really, there is a lot of knowledge, expertise, and political will, if you will, also, <laughs> in this room, that if, if we harnessed it, if we worked hard at it all together, I think Africa would be where uh, we need to be. Uh, so I, I think this is the first thing that I can talk about, and uh, I'm sure the rest is, is what we are all able to do and willing to do, and uh, together again, I think Africa has uh, immense uh, unlimited opportunity and uh, even a capacity in terms of uh, knowledge, expertise, these young Africans, unfortunately, they are doing uh, wonderful things for other continents, for other people. We should be doing that to, yeah. for ourselves as well. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, um, President Kagame, and of course, Madam President as well, for being with us uh, today, and of course, our, the rest of our panelists. Unfortunately, we did have to cut it short because we ran over time. We are still over time, so we would like for you to break for a networking uh, session, and very short, 15 minutes, if you could please be back in the halls uh, further down the convention center. Thank you very much for joining us this morning, and I wish you all a successful and prosperous forum. Thank you. <laughs>